Black Monopoly presents Dope Dialogue. What's good, y'all? This is Dope Dialogue presented by Black Monopoly. Today we got on Chuck Walton. Mm -hmm. Big legend, man. What's up? What's going on, man? Chilling, chilling. How you? Uh, I'm blessed. I'm blessed to be, you know, on the show. Um, obviously, you know, you're doing your thing. I'm a big supporter, so uh, it's a blessing to be here. Appreciate the love, man. For sure. I want to give a shout out to Miles too. Miles in the cut for linking us up. Definitely shout out to the legend Miles in the cut, man. He's uh, he's doing a lot of big things, man. Sure. So shout out to him and everybody over at Atlantic and Highbridge, and you know, they doing their thing. Smooth. Every time I ask somebody, you know, give me some like. Some background on Chuck, just so I get an idea. Everybody yeah. says, "Man, he does everything. He's a supreme dot connector, yeah. a man that makes it happen." Yeah. How would you describe what you do? Well, lately I've been saying that I'm a mix between um, the Black Godfather and World Wide West. You know, so I'm like a hybrid, but uh, I do do everything. Um, I think my title is that I have no title. Um, I'm about winning titles. You know, I got some championship rings and stuff like that along the way. But yeah, I just don't like to be labeled a boxed in. Um, I've never been about that. I've always been a big dreamer, but also a big go-getter. Um, I'm the kind of person, like, I feel like I can do multiple things at once and do them well. You know, some, some people have to just focus on one thing and they can go to the next. Uh, different strokes for different folks. But, yeah, I'm just an all-around guy, you know. Um, I feel like I could win the video game championship if I'm playing video games. Or, you know, uh, if I was a garbage collector, I would want to be the best garbage collector. And maybe I could do both, you know. So I just try to, like try new things, meet new people, and, you know, find where I fit in and be the best in my job. Oh, man, that's a perfect, like, way to play it out right there. <laughs> sure. And For we're going to sure. get back to that uh, winning titles part two, but just to kick it off, could you give, like, a brief just flow of where you come from, where, like, you know, what city, what mm -hmm. environment, what was it like growing up? Yeah, I mean, um, I'm from Chicago, Illinois, um, as you see, you know. Oh, it's got you. Yeah, I keep the city on me. Um, but I was actually born um, in LA. I was born um, in Chino Hills, actually. And I lived out there until I was like five. Then I moved to Chicago. Um, my dad wanted to take the family back home because um, obviously that's where all of my family on his side is from. Um, when I was younger, I spent a lot of time in Oakland, California as well, uh, which is my mother's hometown. So like I said, I've always, I've always kind of been like multi-hyphenated, like a hybrid, just even as a kid. Like, so like I grew up you know, in Chicago, but I spent my early years like in the LA area and then a lot of my, my time in, in, in Oakland, California, you know, so uh, I think that's why, you know, I got all the game that I got because I was soaking it up from multi, you know, multi different places and cities. Uh, but, you know, Chicago is, is what I represent. That's my hometown. Um, that's where, you know, I got, you know, the game, you know, from my dad and all my uncles and, you know, the OGs and everybody that, that helped raise me up. Um, so I spent my time out there and then from, um, from there, I did junior college um, in, in the city as well, and then I ended up going uh, to D.C. I transferred to Howard University, the Mecca, the world's greatest school. Uh, I was literally with, with some people the other day, and um, some high-profile people, and we were talking, and I was like, yo, there's no place like Howard. Like, we got the, we have the greatest alumni, like, there is. Like, it's not, it's not even close, like, from politicians to actors, athletes, like, we do it all, so. Um, DC's like a hometown to me as well. I'm very special. Shout out to the 202, you know, Georgia Avenue, Uptown. Um, and yeah, I left DC and uh, came to LA, and that's where I've been since uh, 2014. So this is home now, you know. Got you. So, what about LA made you make it home? Like, what made you settle down here? Well, like I said, I was born here, so. I was always the kid back home in Chicago that was always like, well, I'm really from L.A., like, you know what I mean? Because I rooted for a lot of the L.A. teams and stuff. Like, my college team was USC because, like, that was my dad's team growing up. Uh, it was, I think, maybe the first sports game I went to it was either them or UCLA. Like, just I always was into, like, the L.A. sports scene. Uh, and then growing up in Chicago and being such a Michael Jordan fan, you know, um, I was young when Mike was doing his thing, but we used to go to the games, you know, I used to you know, go crazy, cry if we, if we almost lost the game, you know? Uh, but then like, obviously when Mike was transitioning out, Kobe was, was coming in and I was like, you know, that was my favorite athlete, like almost even more than Mike. Like they like this to me, you know what I mean? Sure. So um, that was always the goal. Uh, coming out of high school, my goal was to, to get into USC. And then I realized you had to have like, <laughs> you know, crazy GPA and, uh, 
unfortunately, you know what I mean, I didn't take, you know, the books as serious as I should have, which is something I want, like, young kids to, like, you know, look at and, you know, be on top of, which is how I ended up at a JUCO. So when I was leaving Howard, um, I got a job offer from the NFL Network, and then I did my math and did my research, and I was like, oh, snap, looked up the location. It was in Culver City, so I put two and two together. I'm like, that's, that's L.A., and I was like, I was almost sold. I had, like, a lot of offers on the table, but it was just like, it was like my goal was to was to come back out here, but I didn't want to be one of the people that just came out here like just to just come out here. I wanted to come out here and and be set up um, to succeed. Um, Got and you. The good Lord made that happen. Smooth. So you said you got an offer from NFL Network. Mm -hmm. What was your major in college, and how'd you land that opportunity? Yeah, my major was uh, broadcast journalism. Um, so I was in the School of Communications, John H. Johnson School of Communications, uh, at our university. Um, when I got there. You know, I got lucky because I met my mentor, a man by the name of Ed Hill Jr., who's like, uh, I, there's probably very few people in the world that are as connected as, as him. I mean, like, it's like a short list. And uh, I mean, this man had me in the White House. He had me at the Wizards games. He had me like, and I mean, I was in there, you know? Um, so that's kind of how that happened. Like, I, I was a broadcaster. Uh, I got my first internship with BET. Uh, which was unpaid and they pay their interns now you know, you know I was a little ahead of my time uh, but I learned a lot during my internship there this girl named Successful Brim hooked me up with that um, shout out to her um, I bumped into her in the club a while back so shout out to her she kind of like kick-started me in the industry side of things um, and then Howard needed a, a voice to call their sports events and they didn't have one in quite some time in fact they hadn't had one that I guess was like on like a serious level since uh, Gus Johnson, who's now like the broadcasting GOAT. Um, and um, when he was doing it, the games were on tape delay. So they had never done it live because, you know, Howard is an HBCU, so we lack funds and things like that that like, you know, the PWIs, you know, sure. just have naturally. So we have to make do, you know, we got to turn sugar in the, you know, in the wine and, you know, do all that type of stuff. So uh, one day, you know, Mr. Hill, they asked me that I want to take the role, and I was like, cool. I always wanted to be Stuart Scott and those guys. Like, that was always my goal, like, since I was little. So I took on the job. I didn't know, however, that they needed me to do the girls' games as well. So it was, it was kind of like heavy duty, heavy lifting. Um, so I broadcast all the women's games and the men's games, you know, basketball and football. Uh, and it was the best experience, you know, so... Mr. Hill and um, Ricky Clemens um, actually put that together for me for the Howard Sports Radio Network. Um, so I became like the first official voice and uh, we were able to like do like the first live broadcast and stuff from the school. Um, and we got a lot of people that were tu tuning in and um, I just got to really cut my teeth. I learned a lot um, about just how to stay humble and um, how to be a team player um, and just about the business. Um, and I learned about uh, just the tradition because there were so many broadcasters that either went to Howard or, or got their start at the school before me, like Michael Wilbon, you know, Stan Verrett, Steve Weich, Gus Johnson, um, Daryl Ledbetter, um, Jim Trotter, like the history strong. So um, I took the job very serious uh, and, you know, it was great. And it led to just a lot of opportunity for me. Smooth. How'd you score a mentor like Ed? You know, kind of how I met, met you, right? Just talking to people. Um, I had a friend in college who was my best friend, um, and he knew him already. And so a couple days, he'll be like, man, come with me. I, I got to do this work study. And so, uh, well, Mr. Hill is retired now. So I, I, I was like, what kind of work study is this? You didn't do any work, you know, because he was just cool like that. I was like, you just showed up and talked to him, you know. Um, and I just started talking to him, but we would never talk about, like, you know, like work study stuff. It would just be about life, like music, Marvin Gaye. And I think he kind of saw I was kind of like old soul. And he was like, wow, where are you from? And I said, Chicago. And, you know, he's well-traveled and a worldly man. So we would talk a lot about life and, you know, fatherhood and different things like that. Um, and I think he appreciated the fact that, like, you know, I could spend time in his office without just chasing all the pretty girls in the yard all day long, you know. Um, and, you know, before you know it, he just started inviting me out to, you know, family barbecues and, and his entire family became my family. I mean, we're, we're pretty much blood at this point, you know, me and the Hill family. Um, and I had no idea, like, his relevance to just um, African-American culture um, and basketball culture, you know, the family. I mean, like, there's nobody that came through D.C., like, 
that doesn't know who Mr. Hill is, you know? So, um, shout out to Huck. We call him Huck. You know, without him, you know, there is no me. Smooth. Yeah. Speaking to you before, uh, you clarified that broadcasting led to that championship, to that ring. Yes. Could you clarify, like, could you give that story? Yes. So, I mean, that was kind of cool. So, um, like I said, Mr. Hill and Mr. Clemens got me into, you know, the broadcasting. Right when I was about to graduate in 2014, like April 2014, uh, Mr. Clemens invited me and really he invited like everybody th that was kind of like um, in the sports management, like broadcast department to um, New York. And it's funny, like a lot of the kids like didn't go for whatever reason. But uh, my one of my best friends, Serafina Hamer and uh, Nakia McFarlane, they took the trip because Nakia was from Brooklyn. So she wanted to go home anyways. So she's like, you guys can just stay in my house. And I was like, great. And, you know, we got these tickets to Yankee Stadium. We got to, like, meet the players. And they took us on the field. And we met all these big wigs. And um, I was just working the room, man. And um, I remember they went home. You know, women want to get themselves together. I was like, I'm staying up here, man. I'm in New York. And so I was networking at, like, every event, you know, before, like, the, the opening ceremony or whatever. And uh, I got to meet Rob Manfred, who's now, you know, the commissioner um, for baseball, stuff like that. I was meeting all these people. And so um, I interviewed, it was like a seminar. So I interviewed with the White Sox, that's my hometown. My whole family is from the south side of Chicago. You know what I mean? Like my whole family, like, you know, the Robert Taylor Projects. Uh, so I was like, I gotta, you know, that's the crib. You know, I gotta, sure. then I interviewed with the Cubs reluctantly. But at that time I was open to even going back home, like post-graduation. So I was like, let me just see what's up with the Cubs. And I interviewed with this lady with the San Francisco Giants because my mother, like I said, she's from Oakland. But she grew up a diehard Giants fan. Her father, my grandfather, um, you know, they were really into baseball. So I just did it just so I could tell my mom, like, you know. And they also had one of the only African-American HR people that was at the conference. So I felt like I had to connect with my people. And so I told her about my mom's love for, you know, Juan Marichal was her favorite player. If you're a baseball fan, you know that name. And so the lady was like, wow, you know, I really like you. If you come to the Bay, I'll, like, hook you up with, like, the interview with, like, the people that run the team. And so... um I flew to the Bay and I interviewed with like three people. She was one of them. And the second person was a man by the name of Paul Hodges, um, who was like an exec at the team. And he was like, wait, so you do your own podcast? You do all of this? And this was like before podcasting was really like, you know, like, yeah, man, like I edit the whole nine. So he's like, yo, why don't you go to lunch with me? And I was like, man, I got a flight back to D.C. like after this. And then I remember like debating, like he didn't call me right away. I was like me and my dad were riding around. Like, just riding around, I'm like, man, you know. So this man literally called me right when I was boarding the plane. And I debated, like, missing the flight. But then I was like, you know, if it's meant to be, it'll be meant to be. So flew home. He kind of called me one time. Nothing really came of it. So by then, I had to make a, a move. So I had all these job offers um, because I had did this feature um, on this HBCU network that was launching. This man named Curtis Simons and these people did this big feature from BET. Like, they followed me my last year of college they followed me like around with a camera and like so in the feature I shouted out my other mentor who basically uh he actually got me into Howard University uh on some crazy stuff um and he ended up being like the last person to interview Michael Jackson um he just passed away uh, a couple months ago so rest in peace to Mr. Monroe yeah he saved my life but um so I shout him out do this feature so like I'm buzzing now so I got all of these offers I end up doing this big piece with Don Lemon on CNN and it went viral. Um, and it was basically centered around Donald Sterling when he had said the N-word and like got alienated from the team. They had to kick him out the whole nine. And I wrote this piece and it went viral, went number one. And so coming out of that, I had all these job offers. So when the guy from, you know, Paul Hodges didn't call me, I was like, man, I gotta, I gotta go. Um, but also luckily I still was working at ESPN 980 in DC at the time. Like I, I was working at ESPN while I was in school. So I was like, man, I got options, but I really wanted to kind of see if I could leave D.C. And the NFL was right there. So I leave and then I started the NFL Network and like maybe two or three months into the job, the guy calls me. Paul calls me the night before one of the, the Warriors games. It was either like the home opener, or like the second home opener of the season. And he says, hey, uh, you know. I got good news and bad news. I said, well, give me the bad news. He says, the bad news is I'm not with the Giants anymore. So instantly in my head, I'm like, well, why are we on the phone? You know, he goes, well, the good news is, you know, I'm with the Warriors. 
I'm over there helping them with all this new stadium stuff and I'm running like basically like the whole entertainment department like you know um, and I want you to like come be a part of this with me now at this time the Warriors are just another NBA team you know Steph's on the team but they just another team you know and I was like wow this is crazy like this is cool so you know I cut like a, a one-off promo video for them to open up the season and uh, it was fire uh, and my guy Michael Leslie and Ari Glick who was the creative director of the team, um, which I didn't know at the time. They like laid some dope edits over my voice and stuff, and uh, we put it out, and it went viral. And then um, they told me to come to to the to the game, you know, to see it in person. So uh, I got the day off work, flew up to Oakland. Um, they let me take my cousin Cordell to the game, and you know, this is a kid that grew up in Oakland. You know, what I mean, he's from the soil, from the turf, um, and you know. We're three days apart. Like, we more brothers than cousins, you know. So I got to take him to the game. And, and look how God worked. The team they played that night was the L.A. Lakers. And so I ended up, I was in the owner's box, and I tell Paul and them, I'm like, yo, this is great. Thankful. I'm a diehard Laker fan, though. Like, Kobe, my favorite. And so uh, I remember Ari um, took me down, like, down the court side with my cousin, and we sat right behind Kobe uh, for, like, the second half of the game. And uh, I still got like all these great pictures from that day, man. So uh, after that, I guess I didn't do it the next game they lost. The owner came back. I guess he's superstitious. And uh, he was like, he want everything the same. So they basically signed me up for the season. And we won the whole M NBA championship. Like, Damn. and it, obviously, you know, the rest is history with the Warriors. And so I never looked back. It was crazy. And that's God working. Like everything that led up to it, that line like that, the owner coming down saying when everything the way it is. Yeah. That's wild, man. Yeah, man. That's divine intervention right there. Yeah, so it's, it's how did God. you grow and pivot from that and then maximize yourself to where you are now? Uh, well, I, I stayed with them, you know, for a couple of years. And what was cool was like because of because I, I explained to Paul like that I couldn't move to the Bay because I had just signed my lease down here. One and two, I had just signed with the NFL, you know, so I was on contract. So uh, he was like, you know, basically like the work with me. And so basically how I transitioned from, from that point on was, um, you know, I was able to like contract myself out with the team, but I still got all the, st the staff benefits. Like the Warriors are just like A1 organization. So uh, I basically went from there to, uh, I started picking up because like the bigger the Warriors got, the bigger my name got because I was affiliated. So like when I'm going to the games, I'm not, you know, I'm on the court, I'm doing, I'm doing all the same stuff that like, you know, so, I would go to, to events in LA and people would be like, oh, that's Chuck from, you know, Golden State. And I was getting introduced like that. And so I know how to like, just kind of maximize each situation and keep networking. And so um, that would lead to just different opportunities. You know, I ended up getting a stint with TMZ Sports. Um, shout out to Van Lathan, um, and Michael Babcock and Harvey and Evan and everybody over there. So I was at the TMZ thing and I was just stacking from there meeting people, you know, doing cool stories, fun stories. Um, you know, I went from there to, uh, you know, like like these startup companies would start reaching out to me, just wanting me to do like quick video hits or like be like a brand ambassador, you know, giving you four or five thousand a month just to do stuff like that, you know. So things would just start happening like that, you know. But I know how to get in the room and make the room work for me, you know what I mean? And I think that's how I kind of like transitioned. Um, and then once I, I left uh, Golden State, um, I had like a little down period and then... Um, the Howard Network, um, a mentor of mine, had a connection with uh, LeBron and Mav, Maverick Carter. Um, um, my guy, he works at ESPN, he, uh, Marcus Matthews, he went to uh, Howard, you know, he's been working at ESPN for years. So he's I mean, uninterrupted, is looking for, you know, a podcast producer. So he connected me to this guy named Andrew Hawkins, uh, who just won an Oscar um, for um, Hair Love, and he's just won an Emmy, like, Hawk is the man. But I had already knew Hawk because when I was at TMZ, I did a couple stories with Hawk. So like, you know, I knew him a little bit, you know, so he remembered me. And then um, there was this guy named uh, Tunde, um, TD we call him, and they were kind of like doing the hiring process. So I went up to Uninterrupt and met with them, you know, at, uh, at Brian and Mav's office. And then uh, next thing I know, they gave me the gig. And so I got into the fold with them on the podcast producing side. Um, and then I started bringing in some people like to kind of come on the shows and Hawk was like, wait a minute, like you should probably be on the athlete relations team because I have a lot of relationships. 
So they moved me from the podcast team. I kind of was doing both, really. Like, they still had me doing podcasting, but they moved me to what they call the AR team, um, you know, with Jimmy Spencer and the guys. So I was working with them, uh, booking uh, athletes and bringing them in and getting them on platform for different things that we were doing, uh, like the shop on HBO, you know, Chasing Doe, you know, uh, all the dope stuff that they're doing over there. Uh, so, you know, that was a great experience, you know. So, uh, you know, I did that, and then... Um, I ended up launching my uh, my management company, and that's how I kind of transitioned to where I'm at now. Got you. So before we touch on the management company, what's I'm pretty sure there's like a lot of work and factors to it. But what's one gem you could drop about making the room work for you? Um, being strategic about the rooms that you go into. You know, you got to get to that point early um, in life, early in your career. You have to know that, like, uh, no matter where you are at in your career, what position that you think you're at. You know, like people still have to respect you as a person, you know, like a lot of people are intimidated by the room. I'm never intimidated by anybody. You know, I think I'm the, the greatest person to ever live. You know what I mean? So like your confidence has to be like on that peak, like because without confidence, like you're nothing. You're, you'll be you'll shelter your own mind. So that's how you make the room work for yourself. You have to know you deserve to be in that room. Um, and like I said, one thing I didn't like about L.A. when I first moved here was that I would be at these industry mixers or whatever. and people will walk up to me and they will go what do you do and like i hate that because it's like one i have a name two hello you know good evening you know what i'm saying like and three it's like does that even matter like i'm in the same space as you you know we can get to that like but let's have normal human interaction and conversations first you know what i mean um and then then i'll tell you all the cool stuff that i'm doing and then if it makes sense that we can do some business you know what i mean but i want people to know who i am as a person first because like if we're gonna be you know doing business together like it's very important that you know my character and like where i come from and stuff like that uh but yeah you got to make the room the room work for yourself by going in the room with, with pure intentions and just knowing that you deserve to be there you know no matter where it is you could be in the white house like if you somehow make it in there you deserve to be there you know god put you there for a reason so once you look at the game like that the game slows down for you and you just execute whatever vision you're trying to do smooth yeah. So, build, like, onto the the management company, what led you to creating the the management company, and what tools do you need to create that vision that you have for it? Got you. Um, well, what led me into management was I kind of already was doing management for like I, I was doing homeboy management, you know, for a lot of my my friends that are like you know high profile athletes or entertainers. Because I just like to help people, right? Wait, so I, you said homeboy management. Like, what's that? Well, homeboy management is when I'm not monetizing, like, you know, gotcha. my own skills, right? Like, that's what I was saying is I didn't realize my own strength and my own power. Because I'm a talker. I'm a friendly person. I meet people easy. And I just like to help. So for years, I've been helping a lot of, like, a lot of big people for just the love. You know, I was doing things for them because I, I, I was able to get access to certain rooms that, you know, the average person can't just get into. So to me, it's like, oh, you should meet this person. But then it's like, wow, this is like a bag. Like this is like, I literally saw friends of mine that I was taking to like these like extraordinary events, right? And then I seen them go to that same event, maybe, a, you know, a year prior. And I'm like, oh, you were already there? Or like, you know, their homeboy went that I know. And they're like, yeah, man, I paid this PR person like $10,000 for that. So I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What am I doing? Um, but again, I had my, my nine to five, you know, I was doing my thing at uninterrupted and, you know, all these other great things I was doing. You know, I have my, you know, the fantasy football company that I'm a part of with uh, Tony Romo and Andy Albert. So like I had different things where I wasn't thinking about that. Um, and then one night I was actually uh, in North Hollywood leaving a premiere, uh, a boomerang premiere, actually, for a friend of mine, uh, uh, Bria Murphy um, and, you know, from the Murphy family. And she uh it was like, yo, you know, we've been doing all these side things together. And, you know, she's like, I, want, I want you to manage me because she's, you know, an actress in, in, into the art space and stuff. And I was like, wow. And I was like, well, let me sleep on it. And then, you know, I called her the next day and she was serious. And I was like, well, you know, I don't even know the first step. I was like, that's the first step is to get the LLC, you know, come up with a name. Um, and, you know, she was, you know, with my friend at the time. And he was, uh, he was like, yo, you know, I'll, I'll hook it up, like, let's put it together, let's do it together. So we went into business together, um, we, and we started, like, doing the management thing and, like, taking meetings for her art stuff, and, like, that's when I got to really see, like, the management space and, and what it really took, you know what I mean? Um, so I did that for a little bit, and then, um, you know, then 
my girlfriend got pregnant then the pandemic hit and then that's when things was just kind of like haywire you know what i mean um and then i woke up one day and i was like we had the baby and i was like oh man i think i'm kind of like leaning into more of the producing side because you know i was doing this management stuff but like i was in these rooms where it was like people kind of wanted me to produce these things so i was like that might be a different situation so that's when I ended up just doing my own thing, you know, parting ways with my partner, um, you know, mutual. Um, and that's when I launched Living Legends Group, which is what I'm doing now um, and producing a lot of the coolest things that, you know, you guys should be seeing here in the next like 12 to maybe 24 months. Smooth. It's a process. Smooth. What does that process entail in terms of like, well, building Living Legends mm -hmm. and, you know, creating these amazing things you got coming what's that process until um hard work dedication uh mental toughness because you know i launched that company uh in the pandemic you know um and the pandemic was a scary time for me because uh my best friend you know lost his dad um uh, to COVID. um you know which which is which is hard um and then i lost you know my auntie i lost a lot of people to the thing so it was like it was kind of like a hard time you know? and i had a newborn so i was like real paranoid and stuff uh, so just battling through like dealing with like that mental trauma you know what I mean but then also like you know like I like I always say my homie Stevie says he says like we eat what we kill because we hustlers you know what I mean so it's like if I don't work we don't eat you know what I mean so I was having to just like put that stuff in the back of my head and get on my job you know and um just having that mental toughness and then having a goal writing things down um, you're not gonna reach all your goals but you know if you write them down you know, you got to wake up every day and like kind of do a mental check in like, OK, like I don't have time to sulk today, you know. Gotcha. And then when you wake up every morning and you got baby girl looking at you, you know, that's all the motivation I need, you know. Hell yeah. Was that something that immediately switched? Because like I don't have any kids yet, but yeah, I could imagine like once you, you know, you physically see your baby, like did something automatically switch or was that something that took time? Automatically. Automatically. Uh, there's this clip on the Internet of um, Tiger Woods, his father. Uh, I think he's at like some banquet when he was like a teenager, you know, Tiger was like 18 or 19 and he's like, man, forgive me, but I get emotional when I talk about my son, you know, and like that's how much I love my daughter, you know, like it's just like the, the feeling that I had when I first saw her, because like when she like came out, like I was like the first thing she seen, I was like, oh my God, you know, and it was like, like instantly I felt like, you know, my life didn't matter anymore, like my life matters nothing anymore, you know, like everything that I do is strategic so that I could set her up, you know, for her future. Um, Cause my dad set us up, you know what I'm saying. So, you you know, you got to break that that cycle. You know what I mean. So, like, my dad set me up. I got to set her up. You know. So, yeah, it was like an instant, like, well, a gratifying moment. But it was instantly like, okay, like, you got to like, you got to do even cooler stuff. You know, I ain't did nothing yet. That's a super like humble way to look at it too. Cause you've done a lot, but at the same time, you also aware that you got so much more work yeah. to put in. Yeah, I got more work to put in. I mean, I, I still want the mansion. It's, it's you know, sure. it's stuff I'm, I'm going to go get. Like, I've always, everything I, that I've wanted in my, in my journey, I've gotten, you know. And, like, that's the most satisfying part to me is when I see somebody from way back. Because, you know, I know all these people, right? But, like, I'll see somebody and they'll be like, yo, you did exactly what you said you were going to do. And sometimes it didn't happen when I wanted it to. It might have been two years later or whatever. And I always say, like, you know, God will give you the blessing. You may not get it when you want it, but he'll give it to you when it's, it's time, when you need it, you know? Sure. But you got to just stay in the fight, you know? You can't get too high or too low. So you stay humble, hungry, you know, and you work hard, it'll come. Sure. It'll so, come. Aside from being, like, inspired by your daughter, like, looking at you and stuff, we're human, so we all have up and down days. Yeah. Regardless of, like, where we are in life, whatever we achieved. So how do you... You know, snap yourself out of it when you, whenever you have those days where it's just like gloomy. Uh, I think it's somebody that has it worse than me. You know what I mean? Um, like growing up, I got lucky because you know, like my dad moves us to you know one of the nicer you know suburbs. I get to go to like all the nice schools and everything. But then I got my cousins that's right there. They in they in on both sides in Chicago, Oakland. Like they in the field. You know what I mean? So it's like they didn't have it like me. You know, like you know their some of their best memories was coming to stay with us in the summer times and, and my dad is taking you know the whole hood to the baseball games and buying everybody hot dogs and cotton candy and like you know what i'm saying um so i always think of like somebody that has, has it worse than me um 
and then again it's like I'm trying to continue to stay an inspiration you know to all the kids back home that look up to me um, because a lot of them don't get to make it out they don't get to see that next level and so you know that's the motivation for me like when I feel low I'm like man like there's a kid right now that that has this same feeling but every day of the week you know what I mean like can you can you imagine like every day of the week you nine years old, you have to go find what you're gonna feed yourself. Like, you know what I'm saying? For sure. Like those are like like that that's where we come from. Like that's that's our DNA, unfortunately, in our community. You know what I'm saying? For sure. So it's like, how can I get up and complain when like I wake up in LA every day in a nice apartment? You know what I mean? Like I didn't have it rough. Like what what am I tripping over? You know what I'm saying? So but like those are the kids that's gonna change the world, you know? But they can only change the world if people like me, the people like you, give them that inspiration. Like, actually show them positivity and give them something to reach for. You know, not this gang banging and not all this craziness. You know what I'm saying? Like, show them, like, like great stuff. You know what I mean? And that's why, like, I think that I've always done everything my way. And I feel like that's why everybody rock with me. Because it's like, you're going to get the same crazy wild Chuck. But, you know, I'm going to give you my heart. I'm going to give you 150% passion. And, and, and I'll, I'll literally, like, put my life on, on the line for my people. You know what I'm saying? Um, sure. You know, for them to be able to live their dreams. You know, like, Drake is, you know, that's my favorite rapper, you know. And obviously, we got a lot of OVO affiliations, so shout out to the OVO family. But he has a line on, uh, on Club Paradise. It's my favorite Drake line ever. He says, uh, I need credentials for every one of these Toronto kids. I promise they see it with me. We just trying to live. You know, like. That's how I feel. I need credentials for every last one of them Chicago kids, you know? And that's why I'm so grateful to people in this industry because they've always looked out for me. I don't know what a plus one is because they know, like, it's, it's, we come in deep, you know? I need plus 10, plus 20, and they always look out for me, you know? Because sometimes that one moment, that one award show, that you like, oh, it's going to be su super long, whatever, like, there's people that would literally die just to feel that one time, you know? So you can't take that for granted at all. Ooh, all right. Before I get into this next question, uh, I do want to like definitely shout out your dad. Like I never met him, but yeah. just from what you spoke of now, and also from like last time when you're talking about how you scored that ring with the Warriors. Yeah, there was a valuable gem that he dropped on you. Like, would you mind like sharing that? Cause you were into balling and everything, and he kind of made that connection. So when you said it, I was like, damn. Yeah. The way that lined up is, is crazy. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, my dad is uh is, is a big legend back home in Chicago. You know. Um, like I said, you know, from the projects, man, like we went from the bottom to the top. He literally led us there. You know what I mean? Like he came up, you know, super rough, raw, rugged, you know, uh, made no excuses. And uh, my dad's my hero because he did everything the right way. You know, when you grow up in, in, in certain communities, there's so many trappings that's out there. And, you know, my granddad also didn't play that, you know, at all. But like my dad's very self-made, you know, he's a self-made millionaire, you know, um, and did it the honest way. You know what I mean? And that's what I love. Um, but you know, he played ball, he's in the Hall of Fame in his high school, and you know, he went D1, he did all of that cool stuff. And so like, that was like the life that like, you know, was put in front of me, you know, and I very much wanted that, you know, but then I didn't grow to be 6'2", six, 6'3", six, you know, like him and my younger brother got the height, you know what I mean? Uh, but he told me, you know, when my playing career was coming to a close and stuff, you know, he said, Chucky, he said, you know, you're not gonna go pro, but you can go pro in life. And I think that's a gem that everybody needs to hear, especially because when you're young, like even with these young kids rapping and trying to hoop or whatever, like, you know, you can go pro in life. You know, for every LeBron, there is a Stuart Scott or a Steve Weich. Um, you know, there's a Nicole Lynn, you know, she's killing it. African-American, you know, agent, you know, she out here and doing her thing. She just went over to Clutch Sports. So congratulations to Nicole on that move. But like you can go pro in life, you know, and. Sometimes, you know, those people out, outlast the people that do make it, uh, you know. There's people that make it to the league and play one, two seasons, right. you know. And then there's broadcasters that make an honest, great living every year, you know. So they went pro in life. So that was the gym that my dad gave me. Um, and it always stuck with me. Damn, that's crazy. That's smooth. Yeah, that's, real. that's game. For real, before we skate out, your dad gave you that gym. What gym would you give to anybody listening whether it's a kid male female anybody what's a universal gem you would drop that right when you think everything's going bad it's really about to go right that's the gem I, I would tell you you know I've had moments where I literally just was like okay I didn't try everything it's not gonna happen 
and then that blessing would literally fall from the sky. Uh, but it's because I was sending my praises up. You know, they say you're supposed to praise them when things is good, and you're supposed to praise them when things is bad. So that would be my advice. This is like when you can't see the light, like somebody sees it, and that might be the person that saves you and brings you into the light. You know, like each one teach one. Like we gotta reach back, and and, and sometimes somebody gotta get you there. You know, it's okay to like get a little bit of help. You know, like even me, like I feel like I'm very much self-made because I am, you know, because I, I, I had to will myself to go to some of these places, you know, and some of these things I did to get where I'm at, you know. But like, you know, just because somebody tells you to come to the gym at six in the morning, you know, like, yeah, you don't want to do it, but you do it because you're trying to get there. You might get there at 530 on some Kobe Bryant type stuff. So, yeah, you're very self-made, but like. There was somebody that like saw that in you and told you, hey, I'll come to that gym with you at 5.30 and 6. I'll rebound for you. You know what I mean? Sure. So it's like, you know, when you can't see the light, somebody sees the light in you, you know. So don't give up. You keep pushing forward, man. And um, my old coach back in um, high school told me, excuses are the nails that built the house of failure. So don't make them, you know, because nobody wants to hear them. Just keep working, you know. That's all people respect is that work. It's the, it's the reason everybody want LeBron to go get more rings. You know what I'm saying? It's like one ring really should be enough. If you're a champion, you're a champion. They can't take it from you. But people just respect more, more and more wins. And that's what I'm going to go get. And that's, that's what we all about. Hell yeah. Yeah. That's dope. Shit. Uh, anything you want to shed light on? Like uh, anything you want, you know, got coming out? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have a really book, uh, big book deal coming out. Uh, so, later this fall, yeah, with uh, one of the best players in the NFL. Um, so look out for that. It's about his life story. He's got a crazy life story. He's such a, a wonderful dude. Um, so we got that coming out, and then hopefully that'll lead to some even bigger things for him. Uh, I have a big time TV special that should be dropping uh, end of this year with one of the uh, youngest superstars in the world um, that I'll be uh, co-producing. Um, so look out for that. And uh, I have a documentary that more or probably will come out next year uh, with a hip hop icon uh, that we're in the process of uh, taking to the market right now. So those are three things that are coming. Uh, we just launched our day party series, the Soul Sunday, um, you know, parties that we do. We, we, we went global, you know. Got to pull up. Yeah, we got to pull up. Everybody come out. We did the first one this past Sunday and we sold it out. So uh, shout out to everybody for just supporting me, man. Like that just was like. I haven't even got time to reflect on that, but ain't got time for reflection. We trying to win multiple titles, you know, but we got that coming. So shout out to, um, to Cole and, and to Julian um, and everybody on the team that's supporting that and Alana and everybody. So yeah, those are some of the things that I got coming like currently. Um, and then, you know, my daughter just started her music class. So, you know, she might, she might have a gift, man. She, she's doing some things that are like abnormal for a one year old musically. So you never know where that may lead, you know, sure. your daddy, some of that Matthew Knowles and Joe Jackson money, you know, for sure, man. Uh, but yeah, that's it, man. You know, just, just trying to stay, stay out the way, stay happy, stay healthy. Oh man. Thank you for giving your time, your energy. For sure. Uh, just value in general. For sure. Well, matter of fact, where can people follow you too? Like, yeah. Uh, Twitter is at, uh, Chucky Walton, C-H-U-C-K-Y W-A-L-T-O-N. Uh, and then Instagram is at Instagram Chuck, um, you know, Instagram Chuck. So make yeah. sure y'all follow me. Yeah, tap in there, man. And um, yeah, if anybody ever needs anything, man, feel free to DM me and, you know, I'll definitely, you know, reach back. Dope, man. But once again, thanks for giving your time, your energy. Man, thanks for having present. me, man. I love, man. The I love the show and what you're doing, bro. So thanks, it's, it's truly an honor, man. I thank you. Appreciate it, man. With uh, that, dope dialogue. We out. Hey, we gone. Smooth. Shots out. Appreciate it. Boy, you know I got you, bro. For real, man.